All right. I never got around to posting the previous investigation. I know, I know, it was irresponsible. But during my wait for Puppet Master, I started actually paying attention to my college courses, and I really never had time to revisit my first draft. So I suppose I'll just have to post my findings in one long entry, as I have just seen the revival of Puppet Master. The experience was odd. It's hard to remember the things that went wrong unless I run through the entire thing in my head. It's just easier to speak about the first act in that way, I guess. I know that doesn't really make sense when you put it to words, but it's hard to explain. But that's enough of my cryptic buildup. I arrived in Chicago last week, where I stayed with a couple of old high school friends for a few days. We had fun catching up, but I never took my mind off the Puppet Master's regime. The theater that housed the production was rather obscure, located a few miles away from the main city. None of the news articles I've read post-preview have mentioned the name of the theater, so I can only imagine they don't want the publicity. Upon entering the theater, I was given a playbill by a cheery man in a suit, an older gentleman with a weak smile on his face. The playbill itself showed a white silhouette of a young boy, several puppet strings attached to a scribbly red and black heart that hung within his chest. There were white dollies hanging all around him, and I remember thinking it was odd that a preview playbill would be in color as those aren't usually printed out until the show starts making money. Anyhow, I made it to my seat and began to read through the playbill itself. I didn't care much about the names of the cast members, though I do recall seeing the picture for the young boy playing the part of Morator, a 14-year-old named Milton Holiday. The show opened to a long, plodding overture, played mostly with piano, with these odd whistles being played through speakers all around the theater. After about five minutes, the music changed to a more bouncy, light-hearted tune, and the curtain came up. The stage was empty, nothing but the projected backdrop of a village square, with these odd clouds floating above. About ten children in 18th century German clothing skipped on stage, playing with balloons and dolls. As the music progressed, a small mechanical horse wheeled itself on stage. The lights dimmed and the children stopped. The horse dragged along a cart upon which a small curtain puppet box faced the audience. As the cart came to a stop, a large puppet in a black robe flew out from behind the curtain. The children screamed and backed away. Then the puppet spoke. Good day, little ones. What a wondrous day for bout of play, isn't it? Now don't you be frightened, sweetlings. The puppet dressed in black has a tale to weave, and someone has to hear it. Why, even if a story isn't terribly uplifting, it's the relevance of the story that matters, isn't it? Now gather, gather, my poppinjays, for this story, I'm afraid, requires keen ears of a curious child, for only the innocent can see things simply without the distractions of growth. The children looked at each other, then slowly began to gather round the card. Once they were all seated, the puppet let out a chilling laugh. <laughs> now that's the spirit, kitties. Now, this is a story about many things. About love and hate. About dark and light. About the difference between right and wrong. And the difference between wrong and right. But at the core, this is a story about a little boy named Morator. And with that, the light on the cart fades away, and a light fades in on a small boy, holding a broom, smiling profoundly. Morator. 
The rest of the prologue is rather bland, and I can't remember much of the exposition. The puppet, Marader, and Mr. Obsecor share a song. We learn that Marader was an orphan who Mr. Obsecor found on the side of the street five years ago and has since put him to work in his puppet shop. The costumes from this point seem much less historically accurate from the opening scene. Everyone's costumes seem faded and bland in color scheme, but each of the outfits are ridiculously frilly and layered. Some of the story's exposition is changed. For example, Marader's last name, Abensis, has been reapplied from the novel on which the story was based. The staging and set design is oddly reminiscent of Andrew Lloyd Webber's The Woman in White. Most of the sets are made up of hyper-realistic projections that give the illusion of a moving camera. However, unlike The Woman in White, there are far more set pieces which actually have moving images projected onto them, like the revival of Sunday in the Park with George. For example, during one of the opening songs, I can hear them whisper. We see Marader sweep up around the puppet shop. We watch as the front desk and two puppet display shelves spin around on the turntable as the projected background spins slightly faster, adding in ominous shadows and subtle lighting changes. It was dizzying, but effective. Most of Act 1's exposition seemed rather harmless in my opinion. It almost seems like the start of a Disney show. However, I did find my inner critic rolling his eyes at some of the puerile lyrics. My personal favorites being, he pretended he was crying, though he told me he was lying, and he was a sickly boy, knowing not of joy. However, upon comparing the new version to what I've heard about the other two, there are some significant changes to the show. For example, the character of Madame Rapirio has been cut completely. After the cutesy song, Get a Puppet, we are taken to the center of the village. Here, we have one of the songs that had been cut in the previous versions, entitled Whittleteen, in which the villagers celebrate a holiday of the same name. This celebration focuses on the villagers dancing around with puppets and dolls made out of random objects such as twigs, scraps of clothing, and cornstalks. The music is charming, like a folk song, although the lyrics didn't seem to make too much sense. Here, the song where the children sell dolls is used as a bridge in the Whittleteen sequence. Another change is the rearranging of the wind and the whisperings, a song that was originally played in Act 2. In this new version, it is sung monotonously by a group of black-clad people mourning the loss of a young girl, a rape victim. The sequence itself is so strange. Around eight people walk on stage, four of them carrying a small open coffin. The lighting goes from yellow-orange to blue, and the chorus drones on for about eight minutes as they somewhat explain how this girl died. The wind was her muse for play, and she pranced along the riverway. She slipped along the sides of the weeping willow's hairs, and she danced along the riverway with nary remorse. The whisperings from far away calling out for her to stay. She stayed there with the wind and the whisperings of yore, and she danced with him until he saw it fit to take her solace. Again, this uncomfortable assemble song goes on for about eight minutes. From what I could assume, the little girl had been playing along the river when a man asked her to stay with him until nighttime, where he raped her and tried to drown her before a policeman stopped him right as the girl had perished. Other than that, most of Act 1 seemed the same as the other versions, given that there is a small bit where a girl with a puppet mysteriously appears and disappears while Marader sweeps up the shop and another random scene right before the finale in which Mr. Obsecor sings about the hardships of raising Marader. 
a song reworked from the same song Madame Rapirio sang in 1934. The finale's song itself, which so many people had claimed to hold some sort of force to it in the 1934 production, didn't seem all that powerful, though this may be due to a rewrite. The 1934 version was said to be significantly longer than the 1928 workshop at around 12 minutes of non-stop gibberish lyrics. This version has a reprise of the wind and the whisperings, followed by a few verses told through the odd language. The lyrics are, in fact, somewhat odd-sounding after two minutes of non-stop strobe lighting, but I wasn't affected by it. There weren't any deaths after the finale, at least, though the intermission did last ten minutes longer than it was supposed to due to technical difficulties backstage. Act 2 was where most of the changes seemed to be. It began with a light on Marader being strung up on ropes like a puppet, his friends and Mr. Obsaker hanging on either side of him. A new song plays where all the songs from Act 1 are placed into a montage, while the Act 1 finale music plays in the background. Just as the music shifts into the pounding Whittleteen music, Marader awakens. Remember when I mentioned that Act 2 was mostly made up of a bunch of songs placed one after the other for no apparent reason? Most of that has been cut. The only two songs from that long, drawn-out sequence are What Is This Place and Marader's Soliloquy, which has been renamed to Marader Comforts the Puppet and has been changed to a duet sequence. The lyrics have been improved as well. The particular scenes I listed before involve a panicking Marader confronting the puppet dressed in black, who explains that Marader's soul once belonged to a child rapist and that he died before the puppet could punish him. This is where the set designs became a bit odd. There were several floor-to-ceiling metal dollies that would constantly roll about on stage, as if to symbolize Marader walking somewhere. The backdrop went red, and there were projections of puppets flinging the corpses of children along the walls. To say it was unsettling would be an understatement. After this, the story progresses in a similar manner as the 1928 workshop, but with different twists. Marader learns that the odd-looking man in black from the first act was the boy that Marader raped in his past life. The man in black wants to revisit their relationship, but Marader wants nothing to do with him. They spend the next ten minutes singing about what might have been, and Marader begins to remember things. He ends up seducing and dominating the man in black, and they have sex on a bed while a group of children acrobats frolic about on long sheets of fabric above them. Just then, the puppet dressed in black shows up and orders the old man to go away. He explains to Marader that his punishment is to forever serve him, aiding in the future rape and murder of children in the village where he lives. As they both sing the title song, several children, including the little girl who drowned in Act 1, join in, all holding miniature puppets dressed in black. The new ending is a bit confusing, but apparently they're saying that pedophilia is some sort of vicious cycle. When a pedophile dies, his soul is placed in that of a newborn child, who will, by fate, be raped themselves. This influences them to become child molesters in their adulthood. Marader, as well as several other children, manage to defy destiny by escaping their respective rapists, which results in their being enlisted into the Puppet Master's regime. It makes so little sense, and it's all so damn creepy. Then, just like in the 1928 workshop, all of Marader's friends are returned to the puppet shop, but none of them have any memory of Marader.
We cut back to the cart from the prologue, where we see that all the children have disappeared. From the back of the puppet box, Marader and the man in black exit from behind the curtains. They hop upon the horse and begin to trot their way out of town. As they exit the village, they hear a small girl's terrified screams, and she lunges out in front of the cart. She begins to beg Marader and the man to help her, just as an old man rushes out in pursuit. He insists that he is the girl's father, but she sobs that she's never met him before. Panicked, Marader pulls on the horse reins and runs over the man, killing him. The man in black turns to Marader and in his low voice whispers, Marader, what have you done? Before the lights go out. However, right after this scene is where things quickly became wrong. The light slowly faded from the green tint of the forest into a deep blue, similar to the lighting during the wind and the whisperings. The entire company slips out from backstage, holding their miniature puppets, staring directly at us, the audience. Just then, the lights began to flash, and the puppets… I know this sounds kinda stupid to say, but they sang. I don't mean that the children sang while controlling the puppets' mouths. The puppets actually sang. And, oh god, the song. It was that same gibberish from the Act 1 finale. The children, the adults, all of them were holding puppets. They chanted those horrible words over and over again, their eyes unblinking, focused on the audience. Trapped in our seats, we were forced to listen to the song repeat itself over and over. I saw that the cast had begun to move the puppets around in jerking, near erotic dance moves, every now and again twitching in unison with the rest of the company. After a while, I began to feel sick. We were all sick. I could see people in front of me leaving their seats, ready to run out. I tried tuning the chants out, but that only seemed to make them worse. The music pounded within me, causing me to jerk about with each pounding drum. As I leached back in my seat, I realized something. The pounding within me wasn't just from the orchestra, it was beneath me. For a moment, I could see that everyone else could see it too. For a faint moment, we could feel the ground beneath us quake along with the chants. I looked up to see if the cast had noticed, but then I saw the puppets. They were still dancing and moving within the performers' grasps, but the performers themselves were not moving their arms. And then, for a moment, we all found relief. From backstage, several crew members rushed onto the stage, pushing several actors away in the process, one of them screaming out, FIRE! FIRE! SHIT! And then the chaos began. From above the stage, all the lights began to shoot off. The projections behind the actors flickered briefly before shutting off entirely. The company screamed, as did the audience. In a flash of fire and sparks, the actors began to leap off the stage, and we all began to pile out the door. I still had a headache, and I could still hear the pounding. The fire department arrived shortly after the theater was evacuated. About 10 minutes before the trucks arrived, we heard the back of the theater collapse. I've since checked the articles online, and 60 plus attendants of that show, 9 of them being cast and crew, have gone missing. As it turned out, most of the people who didn't leave the parking lot were either helping out, like me, or were too shaken up to drive. When I finally began walking towards my car, a gurney was wheeled right past me. The man I saw laying there, unconscious and hooked up to an oxygen tank, was the same man who handed me the playbill. I drove back to my friend's apartment and went straight to bed. Even in my sleep, I could still hear the pounding. By morning, my headache had stopped but the memory of the night before still lingered. I went to my computer straight away to upload the audio I had recorded. My camera tends to divide long videos into smaller ones, 
and I immediately deleted the last video. Nobody ever needed to hear that, especially not me. I listened through the recording again, making notes in word processor as I went along. I found myself humming to some of the more bouncy tunes, the pounding slowly fading away. My fear of the show had lessened. The idea of supernatural forces destroying the theater seemed far too ridiculous for me to take seriously, and I brushed my fear aside. Once that was done, I went to work scanning the playbill. After scanning the front, I went to work scanning the interior pages. A bit curious, I skimmed through some of the production names. And it was then, right there, on the third page, I saw the picture of the man who handed me the playbill. The man was the head producer and director, a cheery old man with a wrinkled face looking away from the camera. Below his picture, in bold letters, read the name, Timothy Cartwright. My face scrunched, my breath went still. All I could hear was the faint memory of the pounding. That isn't right, I told myself. It isn't possible. It's a different person. It had to be. Timmy Wright died on October 1st, 1935 at the premiere of the Puppet Master's Regime. Everyone saw it. Everyone saw him begging for help, strung up on strings. This isn't possible. Then I remembered something. In my interview with Alice Corley James, she mentioned Marader's squinty eyes and his monotonous acting. Timmy Wright was known for his wide-eyed expressions and over-the-top delivery. It's what made him famous. The person performing Marader that night in 1934 must have been... Rory Atkins, the understudy. That and Garris Creeley had been found dead, killed by a gunshot to the head. Everyone assumed it was suicide. Nobody even suspected murder. I remember Devin's journal, the puppet mask, the clothes, the fascination Garris Creeley had with little cutie Wright. Nobody would ever expect murder. Why would they? And then, to add to my revelation, I realized that among the cast members who had escaped from the theater, there was one boy sitting in the back seat of his mother's car. The vague, empty face of Milton Holiday. Marader. The Puppet Master's Regime is not a simple musical I've come to realize. It's more than just a production. It's a force. An entity, even. It's not just a madman's sick, elaborate scheme to rape his own son. It isn't just a young boy's obsession over destroying his father's work. It isn't only an innocent victim's last attempt at showing the world how he was wronged. It's a greater monster than that. Within the writing and music of this show is something. I don't know what, and I don't even want to know. What? Some kind of monster that refuses to die. People who saw the Puppet Master's regime in both 1928 and 1934 were said to have suffered from lifelong mental effects, causing them to hum tombs they had only heard once. Even now, as I've been speaking to you all, I keep humming the same demented tune of Never Mind Me Mister in the back of my mind. The wind and the whisperings refuses to rid itself from my subconscious. I find myself thinking about this production night and day, singing and thinking about possible death to certain subplots and songs. What's worse is that I know that someday another revival of this demented work will make its way onto the stage. Milton Holiday is still alive, isn't he? And this evil won't rest until it remakes itself again. I've decided not to further this research project anymore and not post any more of my findings anywhere. This includes the audio taken of the revival, and I suggest that none of you attempt to further look into this matter. I assure you, it simply isn't 
worth it. Still not convinced? Let me leave you with this final note. If this doesn't sway you into ceasing your interest, then I have no idea what will. Just before I came on stage here today, I read a few articles about the fire at the theater. Those 60 plus missing people? The fire department has been searching through the rubble and none of the bodies have been found. Thank you to each and every one of you for your patronage and support through this series special. Once again, I am honored to have reached this 500 subscriber milestone, and I eagerly step forward to the future of this channel. Let us all embrace these upcoming blessings together. Good night, everyone. Stay safe and enjoy your weekend. I am Dr. Moxmo, and I will see you next week.